Welcome back to Midweek Politics. I'm David Packman. We're speaking with Chris Martinson, who's in studio with us today. Chris is a trained research scientist, and you make it a point to say you are not an economist. And so why is that a big deal to you? It seems in preparing for this interview, I saw I see you mention that on your website and you've said it in some other interviews. Why is that so important? I want to be absolutely clear about who I am and who I'm not. I do talk about the economy a lot. It's absolutely something I'm... I think we should switch mics because for some reason we're getting a little feedback on his there. There we go. That's going to be better. And just talk very cl- as close as you want to get with the mic. Put it wherever is convenient. There we go. Good. So uh, it's Much very, better. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, David. It, it's just important to me to clarify who I am and who I'm not. I'm not an economist, although I talk about the economy a lot. Mm-hmm. It's something that's very passionately interesting to me. But I did start out as a research scientist, and I also got an MBA, was off in the business world for quite a while. And this makes it, I'm comfortable with numbers. I'm comfortable with data. I like, I like to let the information tell the story. And there's an incredible story out there to be told about our economy. I was calling for the downturn that we're living through a number of years before it started. Uh, there's some other things coming now that I think everybody should be aware of. But I want to absolutely not misrepresent myself and say I, I'm an economist. And uh, actually, I think that's a good thing to be these days because, let's face it, almost all of them missed this story. Well, you know, I don't know if it is because some people tell me that I'm an, econ- an economist. They have an MBA and an undergraduate degree in economics. And some people say that that makes me ostensibly some kind of an economist. And I, have, I had abso- absolutely no idea, no foresight about what was going, on, going to happen specifically beyond the fact that I knew it was really easy to get a mortgage. I saw that there was a lot of, a lot of leverage and bizarre uh, derivative instruments kind of floating around and being in- increasingly used as high profit centers for a lot of the financial uh, companies. So I don't even know that there is a strong advantage to being a so-called economist, at least not one at my level, so to speak. I think someone with kind of the more technical numbers training you have may even be more useful. Well, I came at it from the outside, from the outside in. There, there were, like you say, there's some things that I just trust my gut on. When I saw that there was, there was a hairdresser in Las Vegas, she had 19 homes and was, was accumulating more and more. And the idea there was that she was just going to be able to sell them for more money to someone else. That, that's like the classic shoeshine boy giving tips to J.P. Morgan in 1929 moment. You know, there were a number of moments that were stacking up for me that said, doesn't smell right, doesn't look right. And then I would go in with that hypothesis, dig around for the data. And the more I dug, the stinkier it got. I, honestly, once you put it all in one spot, it's pretty clear that we were going way off the bubble edge. So you are a former Fortune 300 VP. Can you say what company that's with? Which which of these top 300 companies? It was called Science Applications International Corp. Still is. It was private at the time I was there, and it's now public company. And what, what do they do? They do uh, mostly... Uh, uh, defense contracting and other government contracting. That's two thirds of business. One third is commercial. I was on the commercial side. I was a consultant uh, in the pharma industry at that point. And what, so tell, I, I know on your website, you, you outlined somewhat briefly how you transitioned out of that and into what you do now, but kind of sum it up for us a little bit. The, the, the before and after story is kind of uh, stark for a lot of people. Before I came in contact with the information that's now on my website, and it's freely available to anybody who wants to see it, I was living in a five-bathroom house on the coast of Connecticut, waterfront home. I had a boat and a slip, Fortune 300 vice president. I come in contact with this information, start unraveling it, look at it, and my wife and I decided we had to make some changes. At this point, I'm 42. I have three young children, completely ditched the job, the house, everything, and uh, moved to this region of the world up here in Montague, Mass., is where I live now. And we did that because we saw some changes coming that we realized that the lifestyle that we were living was not the one that we wanted to be in, when these changes came. So for instance, with this economic downturn coming, we decided we didn't really want to be holding a big real estate asset of the kind that we thought would decline. That was a very wise move. And what year was this? That was in 2003 when we made the move. So this was well early on. This was 2003 really in the middle of the housing bubble, is it not? Yeah, we were still running up. The peak of the housing bubble was 2005. um, But I wasn't selling the house at that time specifically to dodge the real estate bubble. There were other things that that I was dodging at that point in time, I thought. And so we started on this journey that we've been on because we saw some things that frankly made us afraid. And once we made this transition to a different lifestyle, to a new community, to a much deeper, richer set of connections, now this is something we would have actively done because it's, it's desirable, hmm. more the carrot than the stick. And we have no regrets. It's absolutely the right decision for our family. Uh, but from the American standpoint, it looks like I fell off the American dream bandwagon with a thud. Right. I, I had everything. Well, uh, but there may, was there a golden parachute here? 
No, no golden parachute. Okay, because I, I know we'll, we will get that question. We will get when you say that you that it's a sad story in a sense, or, or it may seem like a sad story. The golden parachute might make it not quite as sad, right? No, no. This was uh, the, no parachute involved in okay. this particular exit. Golden or otherwise? No. Okay. No. Go on. All right. So, uh, <laughs> so here we are now, and I've spent the past five years trying to tell people that there was this big economic hiccup coming, but it's a larger story than that. The economy is the first D I talk about. The second D is energy. And there's a huge story there to be told about where we're heading with energy. The next 5, 10, 20 years are going to be just completely unique in human experience. We've always had one more horizon, one new coal seam, one new energy source. You know, some, some critics like to say, well, the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones, implying that we're not going to run out of the oil age because we're going to run out of oil. It's a completely different process. People move from stones to bronze to steel and so on. We went from coal to, to oil. Uh, now what? And that's the thing. Nobody can credibly say what's it, that question mark around that E. And then the third E is around uh, the environment. And for me, that's really a story about how we're depleting the resources on this planet. I don't care if we're talking about tuna fish or copper or topsoil or freshwater and aquifers. We are ripping through uh, the base resources of this world that, that give us the lifestyles we like to lead, give us the communities we live in, our, our whole culture, our whole sense of, of standard of living. Everything is dependent on taking out not just a little bit more every year, but an exponentially larger amount every year. Hmm. We have to take out more and more and more. And that story of more is coming to a pretty interesting conclusion, if not in my adult lifetime, certainly in my children's. Hmm. So this is well, a, and, and we'll get, and I have specific questions about that. And before we get to that, I, in looking at your website, which by the way, we're speaking with Chris Martinson. The website is chrismartinson.com and that's M-A-R-T-E-N-S-O-N. Um, I get advertisements all the time for crash courses, ebooks, learning seminars, so on and so forth. I mean, it is constant. And some of the ones I get in the mail are an incredible amount of paper. Just, just using the paper I get from people wanting me to follow their stock picks or learn about how they see the economy going in the next couple of years, I could write scripts for two years for this show, literally. Are you giving investment advice on your website? Tell us about this crash course and how is it? It, it looked to me to be different from some of these others, and in some ways it looked to be the same. So I, I think for our audience it would be good to know what exactly goes on on chrismartinson.com. The premier offering we've got is something called the Crash Course. It's 20 video chapters, uh, you know, four minutes long, 10 minutes long, varying. And I put that out there with absolutely no business model and with, with no expectation. This was my mission-driven work. I, I had this information. It was so important. It caused me to change my life and my family's. And I thought I couldn't just sit on this as a product that I was then going to sell to people. So I made it free. Hmm. And anybody can watch that. It's now translated into three full languages on the basis of volunteers. Uh, the Spanish people came out first and got into Spanish. French, Italian are almost done with it. And it's going into nine other languages all around the world. And again, all for free. Uh, and I do offer a newsletter for subscribers, but that's not investment advice. It's really my big picture looking where I'm gathering data and information. I, I call myself an information scout. It's what I do. So I read things and I pull it all together. I might write about oil or I might write about where agriculture is going, whatever sort of, you know, hot at that moment for me. 